Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, if you're, if you're visiting, uh, what we do here at Calvary is we, we, we take a book of the Bible and we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through that book. Um, so we, we just teach what God's Word says. You know, rather than give you man's opinion, we want to give you the Word of God and just, and just break it down and make it real. And so uh, sometimes when you do that, you cover a lot of different stuff that you never would have wanted to cover, but you got to cover it because it's in the Word of God. So with that, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we find ourselves this morning. And by the way, we, we've got our work cut out for us today uh, because if you remember last week, we left off at verse 9 of chapter 7. So this morning, we're, we're going to pick it up in verse 10, and then we're going to finish the rest of this chapter. But if you notice, this is a sizable chapter. There's, there's like 40 verses in this chapter. So we got a lot of ground to cover. And, and so we're going to finish this chapter in a message that I've titled, Singleness, Marriage, Divorce, and Death. Uh, but first, before we jump into this, let's, let's take a moment and pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that this is much more than just a book. We're not reading the opinion of a man. We're reading the living word of the living God. And so we pray that as we read your word this morning, our hearts would hear your voice, that you would speak to us about the condition of our lives, whatever the condition of our lives happens to be, Lord, that we would hear your specific word for us in this place today. Lord, not for just our benefit, but Lord, that we'd be changed by your word so that we'd be a people no longer uh, the way we were, but now we're people of the word, people bringing you glory. Our marriages are bringing you glory. Our, our, our lifestyle would bring you glory, but, but we'd be people that would honor and glorify you because your word is changing us. We pray this now in Jesus' name, and everyone say it. <clears throat> Amen. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, uh, you remember, last week in the first part of this chapter, we, we saw that the Corinthians had first written a letter to the Apostle Paul, and, and in that letter, they were asking Paul a number of questions, right? Now, among those questions, they, they, they were asking uh, about marriage and divorce. You know, specifically, they wanted to know, what are the grounds for divorce? Or, or uh, you know, if you get divorced, can you ever get remarried? And, and, and if you can, then, then what are the grounds for remarriage? Now, along with that, they were also wanting to know, you know, if, if, if you were a Christian and you happen to be married to a non-Christian, can you divorce your pagan spouse and marry a cute Christian instead? So these were some of the questions that are going to get answered here in this message titled this morning, Singleness, Marriage, Divorce, and Death. So now with that, as we go back now to, to verses 10 and 11, first of all, Paul answers the question of what about divorce? What about divorce? Paul says in verse 10, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, in these two verses, verses 10 and 11, we, we find two different categories. In verse 10, we have the category of married, and in verse 11, we have the category of unmarried. Married versus unmarried. For example, in verse 10, uh, he says, to the married, I say. Now, that word married in the original is, is the Greek word gamos. Now, gamos is, is, is a word that we get, we get words like wedding or wedding ceremony or marriage. Whereas in verse 11, he, he then mentions the unmarried. Now, the word unmarried is, is the Greek word agamos. It's actually the same Greek word as the other one we just mentioned. It just has the letter A attached to the front of it. Now, now by the way, in the Greek language, whenever, whenever the letter A is attached to the front of a word, it actually negates the rest of that word. In other words, it, it makes it mean the opposite of what it would normally mean. So this, in this case, if, if in verse 10, if verse 10 is speaking about those who went to the altar and exchanged vows and had a wedding ceremony and got married, well, then verse 11 is speaking of those who undid their marriage. They got divorced. Now listen, this is relevant to our time. I mean, look, we, we live in a day of, of, of the shotgun wedding and the quickie divorce. In fact, more people today seem, seem more concerned about how to get out of their marriages than they do about how to uh, make their marriages better, how to make their marriages work, which is why, by the way, more than a million people get divorced in the United States every single year. In fact, five out of every nine marriages in America end in divorce, and this is why the United States has the highest divorce rate in the world. And so what we're saying is that this passage is relevant because, listen, we, we need to realize that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, he was writing to a culture that was just like ours. 
this ancient Roman Empire. He's write, writing to this culture that, that was just like ours, if not even worse than our culture. In fact, did you know that, that the average Roman citizen was married and divorced 20 different times? The average Roman citizen. And that's why, as I shared last week, there was a common joke in the Roman Empire that said that, that, said that you can count a person's years by the number of times they've been married. In fact, the, the Roman statesman Seneca fam famously said, women are married just to be divorced. And so they had a very low view of marriage. In fact, even among the Jewish people who had the highest view of marriage, they still had a very high divorce rate. And they had a high divorce rate because the rabbis in those days basically taught that you can divorce for pretty much any reason you would like. For example, Rabbi Hillel had famously said, if a wife spun around in the streets publicly and embarrassed her husband, it was grounds for divorce. If she even talked to another man, it was grounds for divorce. If she was too loud and, and the neighbors could hear her, it was grounds for divorce. Then there was another famous rabbi of that time who, who said that if your wife burnt your dinner, that was grounds for divorce. They were literally teaching that you could divorce for practically any reason in the world. In fact, in the ancient world of Rome, of the Roman Empire, the number one reason for divorce was, quote unquote, incompatibility of temperament. Incompatibility of temperament. Sounds a lot like our, our modern day irreconcilable differences, right? Right? So now with that context in mind, let's also keep in mind that, that last week in the first part of this chapter, we saw that, that the Corinthian Christians were, were, were getting divorced because they believed that it was more spiritual to be single. They basically believed that, 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 that marriage was sinful and that singleness was holy, kind of living by the motto that, that singleness is next to godliness. And so what was happening is that, is that singles were, were staying single, and then married people were actually becoming single again by getting divorced. And now on top of that, now we also see that, that there were also Christian couples who, who, who were, you know, maybe it's a Christian man who's married to a non-Christian woman, a Christian man married to a pagan woman, or vice versa. And, and, and so now the, the Christian wants to know if, if, if they can divorce their spouse, if they can divorce their pagan spouse. Why? Because they're afraid that their pagan spouse might drag them back into a lifestyle of paganism. They might drag them back into the lifestyle they just got saved from. And so they're wondering, you know, can, can we divorce our pagan spouse before they, before they drag us away from the Lord? Now, you know, here's, here's this, this the, you know, this couple perhaps in the church. You know, maybe they're sitting there week after week and they see these, these cute Christian couples sitting side by side, you know, holding hands during, during church and, and maybe, you know, patting one another on the back and all these things. And they think, oh, I wish that was me. And maybe week after week and week after week, they, they start to think, you know what? I think I heard God speak to me audibly. I think he said, my child, go us forth and, and do us likewise and, and, and divorce thy heathen husband. Listen, that was not the Lord. But you're like, oh, but it was in the King James. Listen, the devil can quote King James too. And so here you may have one group who felt like, 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 they, like they had irreconcilable differences, or you may have had another group that felt like, like it was more spiritual to be, to be single, and so they're wondering if they should get divorced. Or maybe you had another group who, who was married to, to an unbelieving pagan spouse, and they're wondering if they should get divorced. And, and Paul's answer to all of those categories is simply this. At the end of verse 11, he says that the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, it works in the reverse as well. The wife should not divorce her husband. But he says, do not get divorced. Listen, marriage is for life. You've heard me say it before, but it's been well said that wedlock should be a padlock. Hey, listen, marriage is for life. Remember, Jesus said in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 9, he said, what God has joined together, let man not separate. It's for life. In fact, we all know that, that God said in Malachi 2.16, God said, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Now, while it's true that, that marriage is for life, and while it's true that God hates divorce, we do know that, that biblically there are some allowances for divorce. And so now as we pick it up in verses 12 through 16, that's what Paul deals with. He, he deals with what are the biblical grounds for divorce. <clears throat> Verse 12, Paul says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. Now, by the way, that little parenthetical uh, sentence there when he says, I, not the Lord, 
Here's what the Apostle Paul is not saying. I repeat, not saying. Paul is not saying, hey, this is just my opinion. You know, uh, you know, don't really, you know, you don't have to listen to this if you don't want to. You know, just take this with a grain of salt. You know, just, you know, take it as you will. Take it or leave it. That is not what he's saying. When he says, it's, it's I, not the Lord, what he's saying is that Jesus did not teach this in his lifetime when he was on the earth. This is not a teaching of Jesus when he was here, but nevertheless, the Holy Spirit is giving me new revelation. This is the word of God. This is from God's word. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. It just wasn't the Lord Jesus who taught it when he was here on the earth. And so he says, to, to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she's content to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a, has a husband who is an unbeliever and, he's con- and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children may be unclean, but, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For for how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, again, the Bible gives uh, some some allowances for divorce. In fact, the Bible gives two allowances for divorce. Now, one reason for divorce is is something that Jesus dealt with in his ministry, something that he taught. And the second reason for, uh, for divorce is what the Apostle Paul is dealing with this morning in this passage. Now, first of all, reason number one that Jesus gave. And, and that is uh, that, that in cases of adultery, Jesus said, you, 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 can, you, you, know, you, you, you may get divorced. And so while it's true that, that God hates divorce, Jesus is saying that in cases of adultery, then, then, then there's an allowance, there's an exception, you may get divorced. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to be an adulteress, and anyone who, who, who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now listen, in this ancient world that Paul was writing to, you have to understand that, that not only was, was, was divorce common, but adultery was even more common. In fact, it was more common than the common cold. In fact, uh, the Greek statesman Demosthenes had, had famously said, we keep prostitutes for pleasure, we keep mistresses for our day-to-day needs, but we keep wives for the bearing of children. And so to them, adultery was a way of life. It was as common as breathing. Listen, what I'm saying is that this passage that we're reading this morning is so relevant that the book of 1 Corinthians could have been called the book of First Coloradans, you know, First Americans. In fact, you've heard me quote this statistic last week, but, but a study shows that, that one-third of all married people in America have had or are currently having an extramarital affair. One-third. And another study says that, that, that 62% of Americans, that's the majority of Americans, 62% of Americans say that there's nothing wrong with cheating on your spouse. This is the culture that we live in, and it's not that different than the one the Apostle Paul is dealing with in this chapter. In fact, the only difference between them and, 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 and our culture is that they might have been riding in chariots, and we might be riding in a Prius. Other than that, it's the same culture. The same problems. And so, yeah, Jesus makes this allowance that, that, that you know, he, God hates divorce, but, but if adultery has been committed, then there's, there's this exception. It, it, with the exception of adultery, he says, then, then, then you may get divorced. Now, listen, when, when it says that, that if adultery has been committed, it's not saying that it's mandatory to get divorced. It's not saying that that if you are cheating on, you have no other choice but to file for divorce. It's saying it's an exception. It's saying it's an option. But listen to this. Uh, Infidelity is not only grounds for divorce, but infidelity could also be grounds for forgiveness. You know, maybe maybe you're married and and maybe your spouse cheated on you. They were unfaithful to you. But you know what? Maybe maybe they repent and and they're brokenhearted about it and and they love you and they want to make it work and maybe you still love them. Then you know what? By all means, Make it work. By all means, you know, do whatever you can. You know, get some counseling. You know, invest in your marriage. In fact, make it better than it was even before. By all means, do everything you can to restore that marriage. 
But you know, there are times, and, and I have no better illustration for this, so, so bear with me, but there are times where say that you're married to somebody, and, and there are some people who, 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 for lack of a better illustration, are like serial adulterers. Meaning that, you know, maybe they cheat on you one time and, and you forgive them, but then they do it again and again and again and again. And every time it's like a part of you dies. Every time it's like, you know, you don't know how much more you can take. You know, and, and, and it gets to the point where, where your heart gets harder and harder and harder. And that's why on another occasion, Jesus said that Moses allowed for divorce because of the hardness of your heart. Because every time something like this happens, your heart gets harder and harder and more and more callous. And, it, and, 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 it, and it's hard to go through this where, where you just feel so violated and so broken. And so God makes an exception. He provides a way out. He understands the hardness of the heart. And so in those cases of adultery, then, then he says divorce may be permitted. Now, number two, the second, the only other reason in the scripture for, for divorce would be, quote, unquote, abandonment or desertion abandonment or desertion. Now, that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here in this chapter this morning. He's dealing with abandonment. And in fact, for example, in verse 12, he's talking about a, a, a Christian man who has an unbelieving wife, and, but it says at the end of verse 12, it says, and, and, and if she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. It says he should not divorce her. Now, that's how that reads in the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible, and many other English translations render it very similarly. However, the ISV, the International Standard Version, renders it this way. The ISV says, he must not abandon her. He must not abandon her. Now, in this context, I think that's the better rendering. Why? Well, because specifically, remember what the Apostle Paul was dealing with in this passage. What Paul is dealing with are, are these Corinthian Christians who are actually abandoning their pagan spouses. These, Christian, uh, these Christians in the city of Corinth who were, who, who were deserting and divorcing their unbelieving spouses. That's what Paul's dealing with. And so in this passage, Paul's kind of putting the, the onus of responsibility on the Christian. He's saying, hey, listen, if you're a Christian who's, who's married to a non-Christian and yet they love you and they want to make this work, they want the marriage to work, then he says, you know what? Then, then stay married. The best way you can honor God is by honoring your wedding vows. You honor him by honoring your wedding vows. So stay married. In fact, don't just stay married. Make your marriage better than it's ever been. Invest in your marriage. You know, pursue your marriage. Make your marriage the best it can be. But then Paul adds this. In, in verse 15, he goes on and he says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, some translations use the word instead of separates, they use the word deserts or, or abandons. And so Paul's saying, listen, you know, as, as, as the Christian in the relationship, you're the one with the responsibility to make it work. Do everything you can to make it work. But if they desert you, if they abandon you, if, if they divorce you, well, then you're free. I mean, you did your part. You, you know, it takes two to tango. You did your part. They didn't want to tango. But you gave it everything you had. And yet, if, if they, the, the non-Christian, deserts you, well, then you're free from that. And by the way, there, over the years, there have been a lot of loosey-goosey kind of definitions of this word abandonment that get thrown around. Sometimes Christians will talk about abandonment and they'll say, well, you know, if, if, they, if, if they're emotionally distant or, or if, if they're emotionally withdrawn, you know, that's, that's like abandonment, at least emotionally. Or they'll say, you know, if there's mental illness or, or an addiction or this or that or the other. Listen, that is not the biblical definition of the word abandonment here. In this context, the word abandonment is talking about an unbeliever a non-Christian who literally, physically deserted you, the Christian. The, the non-Christian who walked out on you. The non-Christian who filed for divorce. And so it's not permitting the Christian to abandon. It's telling the Christian, you stay put. You fight for the marriage. But if the non-Christian deserts you, then you're free. And so the two cases for, for, for grounds of divorce, adultery and then also biblical abandonment. But now, verses 17 through, through 38, Paul basically has one message. And that message is to remain in the condition that you're in. Verse 17, he says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. 
Was, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Uh, was, was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one, here's the key verse, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, uh, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord is, as a bondservant is, is a freed man of the Lord. And, and likewise, he who is free when he was called is the bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in, in whatever condition each was called, let, there let him remain with God. So now it's interesting, two different times, once in verse 20, and then again in verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, to remain in the condition that you are called. Now he uses two different illustrations, one illustration about circumcision, and then, a, and then an illustration about slavery, but his bottom line message, his bottom line point, is to remain in the condition that you're called. So now in, in, in this context, in the context of, of singleness and, and, and marriage and divorce, here's what Paul's saying, he's saying, you know what? Be content with wherever you happen to be. Be content with where God has you with, and, and wherever it happens to be that God has you. Stop walking through life wishing that, that you were something that you were not. So in effect, what he's saying is, you know what, to, to the single person, he's saying, hey, listen, if you're single, be content being single. If God has you as a single person right now, don't, don't walk around your whole life, you know, oh man, I sure wished I was married. Or if you're a married person right now, be content with the marriage God has given you. Don't walk around your whole life like, I wished I was single. It's been said that, that marriage is like flies on a screen door. The ones on the outside are trying to get in, but the ones on the inside are trying to get out. And Paul's saying, stop being like the flies. Be content with where God has you at the moment that he has you there. Be content. Verse 25. Now, concerning the betrothed, now, in our vernacular, we would say the engaged. Now, concerning the betrothed, I, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one uh, who, who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of this present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are, are, are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. And, and, if, and if, you, if you're betrothed to a woman, I'm sorry, if a betrothed woman marries, she's not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you of that. This is what I, what I mean, brothers. At the appointed time, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and let those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who, who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who, who, who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For this present form of the world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the, the things of the Lord and how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or, or betrothed woman is anxious about the, about the things of the Lord, uh, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay a restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure the, the undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, oh, by the way, some translations will say properly toward your virgin, and, and that troubles a lot of people, and you're like, what did I just read? It's talking about two couple, you know, two, two people, a young man, a young woman that are, that are engaged, that are betrothed. They're engaged, and, and, if, and if, the young, uh, if the young couple is having a hard time keeping their hands off each other because, you know, there's passion, he's, he's saying, you know, then, you know, then you know, here's what you do. He says, if, if anyone thinks he's, he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, his passions are strong, and, and, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his, his desire under control and has determined in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Now, there's a mouthful there. Now, first of all, uh, 
you know, we often hear people quote this passage as sort of a way of saying, hey, you know what, you know, when, when you're single, single people, they, they have more time to serve the Lord, right? You know, they, they don't have any distractions. They don't have to take the kids to soccer practice or, or to swim meets or, you know, they don't have to plan dates and, and, and do all the things, you know, they, they, they can use all their free time to serve the Lord. Now, while there may be some truth in that, I think the key to understanding what Paul's saying here is, is back in verse 26. Notice verse 26, he says, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. And he says, in view of this present distress. Now, the good Bible stu student would say, in view of what present distress? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the present distress, that, that would be uh, the, the persecution of Christians by the Roman government. We know that at this point, Christian persecution was, was at an all-time high. In fact, Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us that, that, that Nero would take Christians and wrap them alive in the skins of, of wild animals and then have them torn apart and mauled alive by wild dogs, and he did this for entertainment. We're also told that, that he would take Christians and take them to his garden and strap them to the post in his garden, cover them in pitch and tar, and then light them on fire and use them as human torches in his garden. And we're told in history that, that a common tactic in that day to get a Christian to renounce Christ as their Lord and instead profess Caesar as their Lord, but to renounce Christ, that they, they, instead of torturing you, they would instead torture your wife or your son or your daughter in front of you until you renounced your faith in Christ. So it's in light of that present distress that the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, listen, in, in, in the times that we're living, these times of intense persecution of Christians, these times where, where Christians are, are, are being strapped to post and burned alive, being fed to wild animals, in times like this where, where they might not only torture you, but they might torture your wife in front of you, torture your baby son, your baby daughter right in front of you. He's saying, you know what? In these times in which we live, if you're single, it might be a good idea to stay that way. If, if you're not married and, and you're living in these times, you might be better off not watching a wife be tortured right in front of you. Not watching a baby of yours be tortured right in front of you. He's saying, you know, so, so if, if, if you're single or, you know, or if you're engaged, you might want to, like, you know, put that on hold for a moment. You might want to, you know, because uh, these are intense times, he's saying. But, but nevertheless, he says, remain in the condition that you're in. In other words, even if you are married in these times, then remain that way. Just understand these are intense times and that marriage is for life. In fact, it's until, as we pick it up in verse 39, it's until death do us part. And so verse 39, Paul says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her, if her husband dies, she's free to, to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. In other words, to a, a, to a Christian. Verse 40, yet in my judgment, she's happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Now, it's interesting. Paul says, in my judgment, it's better that she remains as she is. Uh, the, the New American Standard Bible renders it this way. It says, but in my opinion, she's better if she remains as she is. Now, remember, last week we saw that, 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 that at one time, the Apostle Paul probably was married. But then something happened because now he's single. And so uh, we speculate and we wonder, well, what happened? Did he, did he get divorced? Did, did, his, did his wife leave him because, she, because he became a Christian? Because we know at that time in history, rabbis were teaching that if your spouse became a Christian, you were to divorce them. So maybe he's a divorcee. Maybe his, his wife left him because he's now a Christian. Or then again, maybe his wife simply died and he's now a widower. We don't know, but what we do know is that at the moment, he's currently single and he's happy that way. He's content. In fact, he's convinced that God's called him at this moment of his life to be single. So now with that in mind, he, he then says, well, in my judgment or in my opinion, she's happier if she stays the way she is, if she remains as she is, if she stays single. So in effect, what Paul's saying is, listen, if, if people like me who have been called by God to be single for the rest of their life, if people like me who are called to be single all of a sudden get married anyway, I mean, they know that God called them to be single, but they, but they take matters into their own hands and they get married anyway. He says, you know what? You're, you're, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be discontent. You're going to be unhappy in your marriage. Because one of two things is going to happen. Either you're always going to be, be wishing that, that you could do more for the Lord, 
that you know you could be like a single person who has all this time and you could do this for the Lord and that for the Lord, or you're going to be frustrated and, and, and instead you're going to do all these things for the Lord and, and, your, and your marriage is going to suffer. One or the other is going to happen, but you're going you're gonna to be frustrated. He says, he says, if you're called to be single, then you would be happier staying single. And by the way, that's what happened to John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley, you know, historically, we know that John Wesley is, is world famous for, in the 1800s, preaching the gospel, right? I mean, this is a man who, 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 who traveled 250,000 miles on horseback to preach the gospel. This is a man who preached 80,000 sermons in his lifetime. And yet this is also a man who, on, on more than one occasion, went public saying that, that he thought that God called him to be single. The problem? He was married. But on several occasions, he, he publicly said that he thought God called him to be single. So this is a man that traveled all over the world and, and you know, by horseback, traveled everywhere, preaching the gospel. He was never home. And the few times that he was home, he would devote so much time to prayer and to Bible study, his wife never saw him. So you know what happened? She left him. And so Paul's saying, listen, if, if you're called to be single, stay that way. Don't take matters in your own hands. Force it and get married because you're just going to be frustrated. You might end up like John Wesley. But by the way, you know, maybe, maybe somebody thinks, well, what if you've already done that? I mean, what if, what if, what if you, you knew that God called you to be single, but you took matters in your hands and you got married anyway? Now what do you do? Well, your answer is in verse 20. In verse 20, Paul says, remain in the condition that you're in. Remain in the condition you're called. In other words, even if you did take matters in your own hands, even if you did get married knowing that you're supposed to be single, but you got married anyway, well, now you know how you glorify God? By honoring your wedding vows. You honor God by honoring those wedding vows. And don't just stay married. No, make your marriage the best it can be. Invest in your marriage. Make it a healthy marriage. Make it a marriage that brings glory to God. But in verse 39, he, he, he's, he's saying that if you're married, it's for life. Notice in verse 39, he says, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. Now, by the way, the Apostle Paul in, in our passage this morning was not only teaching on the biblical grounds for divorce, but he's also, and by the way, those, those grounds, again, by way of review, were adultery and abandonment. But he's also teaching the biblical grounds for remarriage. The biblical grounds for remarriage. For example, number one, in, in, in the case of adultery, where, where you were faithful to your spouse, but they were unfaithful to you. You, you did everything you could, but they, but they broke the marriage covenant. They, they, they broke the covenant by cheating, and, 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 and so now you're separated. Now you're divorced. Well, in that case, you are free to remarry. Now, that doesn't mean that the adulterer, the one guilty of cheating, doesn't mean they're free to remarry. Just the victim, the one who is cheated on, is free to remarry. Now, number two, the second uh, case would be the case of abandonment. That if you, were, as a Christian, were married to a non-Christian, and yet despite your best efforts, they left you, they abandoned you, they divorced you, well, then you are free to remarry one day. And now number three, the third case for remarriage would be death. You know, we often say, till death do us part. And we read here in, in verse 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. In other words, the term of, 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 of your marriage covenant with each other is only binding as long as both parties, the husband and the wife, are still alive, right? Right? It's, marriage is for life, it's not for eternal life. But once someone in this lifetime has, has departed, if, if, if something happens and you want to remarry at some other point, you are free to do that. For example, we see the same thing in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 2. For, for the woman who has a husband uh, is, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. It's till death do you part. It reminds me of an older lady named Ruth uh, who had been married for 62 years. So they're at a prayer meeting, and the pastor, he's like, you know what? I just want to commend Ruth. I just, you know, I mean, Ruth has been married for 62 years. Can you imagine? He says, Ruth, tell us. I mean, in, in the, all those 62 years, was there ever just even just one time where you considered divorce as an option? Just even once. She says, oh, no, I, I never considered divorce as an option. But oh my heavens, I, I think I lost track of all the times I considered murder as an option. 
Listen, it says, till death do you part. It just doesn't say what kind of death. Um, <laughs> now, as we bring this to a close, now when I say that phrase, bring this to a close, that means we still have 45 minutes. Um, let, me, let me give a word for, for the singles this morning. And the word is this. Listen, I believe that, that the key to a marriage God's way is to first of all be single God's way. Let me say that again. The key to a marriage God's way is to first be single God's way. Listen to this. Don't wait until you're married. Don't wait till you have a family to become the man of God or the woman of God that God's called you to be. Listen, start now. Put God first in your life here and now. Listen, it, yes, it's important to, to, to find the right person, but you know what? It's even more important for you to become the right person. So seek God now. Give your whole life to God now. Start now. Listen, if you want to divorce-proof your future marriage, well, then, then it's important for you to find someone who loves Jesus as much as you do, or for that matter, even more than you do. You know, a lot of times we, we talk about being unequally yoked. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? When we talk about being unequally yoked, we often talk about a Christian who's, who's dating a non-Christian, right? In fact, sometimes we, we call this missionary dating. Missionary dating meaning what? Meaning that you're going to go on a missions trip for one. <laughs> you know, you're dating the one non-Christian, and, you, you know, and you're thinking, you know what? Well, maybe, maybe I can reach them. You know, maybe I can win them. Maybe I can influence them for Jesus. And, and yeah, maybe. But then again, you know what? Maybe they might influence you. Maybe they might win you. Maybe they might influence you away from Jesus. Ever think about that? And so we, we often call this missionary dating. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, a columnist named Terry Mattingly, a couple years back, wrote an article titled The Evangelism Between the Sheets. <laughs> and in the article, he says, missionary dating has been taken to a whole new level. Uh, according to new research, a, a surprising number of females have graduated from missionary dating to missionary cohabitating. Listen, can I tell you, and I've heard this said before, that missionary dating invariably leads to missionary heartache because it never works out the way you hoped it was going to work out. It almost always ends with heartbreak. So listen, don't lower your standard. Don't lower your standard by, by dating someone who's not a believer, who's not a Christian. Instead, look, look for a man of God. Look for a woman of God. Look, look for someone who, 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 who you, you're equally yoked with. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Look for someone who's actually more godly, more spiritual than you are, someone who, who pushes you spiritually. Can I say that I think it's actually possible for two Christians to be unequally yoked? You know, usually when we talk about being unequally yoked, we're talking about a Christian with a non-Christian. But I think it's possible for, for two people that are both Christians to, to, to be unequally yoked. Here's what I mean. What I mean is, is that, you know, maybe, maybe you're a little further along in your walk with the, with the Lord. You're further along in your relationship with God. Maybe you've been a Christian for five years or, or for 10 years or for 15 years, and maybe they just got saved. Maybe they just became a Christian. You're like, yeah, but they checked the box. You're like, they're hot and they're saved. Checks the box. Well, listen, maybe you need to raise the bar a little bit. Maybe you need to raise the standard. Let, let me put it this way. Pardon the analogy, but, but let's say that you're like 40 years old. You're like 40 years old, and, and, and you meet someone, and you're interested. But the problem is, they're like in preschool. Now, would you date them? Like, ew, right? Well, listen, in the same way, don't date a spiritual preschooler. If you're a mature believer in Christ, find somebody you're spiritually compatible with. Find another mature believer in Christ, not a brand new babe in Christ who just became a Christian yesterday. Find someone who's going to challenge you. Find someone who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna spur you on in your faith. Someone who's going to make you better in your walk with the Lord. Who's going who's gonna to spur you on. Listen, don't wait. Again, don't wait until you're married. Don't wait until you have a family to put God first in your life. Put God first in your life now, even as a single person. Just as Jesus said, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these will be added to you. So I believe the key to a marriage God's way is to, first of all, be single God's way. Honor him now. Put him first now and raise that bar to this level and have enough faith to believe that no matter how, bar that, that how high that bar was, how high that standard was, have enough faith to believe that God will bring someone who clears that bar, who meets that standard.
Trust in the Lord to provide your needs. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that your word faithfully speaks to literally every area of our life. Whether it's matters of singleness, whether it's matters of of marriage, even divorce, even remarriage. Lord, you speak. And so we pray that you would give us the ears to hear, but also the heart that would be willing to accept it. Sometimes it's not that you're not speaking, it's that we don't want to hear it. It's hard to hear. So we pray that you'd give us listening ears and accepting hearts so that your word may come into our heart and actually change our heart and bring glory to you in the process. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Why don't we stand and sing one more time to the Lord.